Alright guys, so today we're going to be checking out Starfleet Command by the Templin Institute. And this is of course about Star Trek. And it is one thing that I know a lot about that I just simply have not ever really covered in the channel. Um, right now I'm covering SCP, 40K, a couple other things, history, I love it all. But I do know a good amount about Star Trek and I have never really gone into it. I think maybe out of uh, out of all the videos and every upload that I've done, maybe one or two was done on Star Trek itself. But in any case, this is the Templin Institute's video on them. It's going to be informative. It's going to be good. We're going to enjoy it. So let's have some fun, guys. And here we go. Rarely do high ideals survive oh. the practicalities of the universe. I actually do really, really miss uh, this presenter's voice. I don't know what happened. It is really none of my business to know. But um, I miss this uh, presenter's voice. But at the same time, is is what it is. Here we go. Yet for over two centuries, the dream of the United Federation of Planets has not only been a reality, but one that has spread throughout the stars. That dream has been confronted by antagonistic alien nations, unfathomable cosmic intelligences, mm -hmm. and the wondrous, terrible nature of exploration itself. In the face of these challenges, the Federation has not only triumphed, but created new opportunities for mutual understanding and discovery. The accomplishments of the United Federation of Planets are as extraordinary as the instrument through which they have been achieved, the vast peacekeeping and humanitarian armada of Starfleet Command. Mm -hmm. Starfleet is the Federation's primary exploratory and defense service. It is charged with the advancement of the Federation's knowledge of the galaxy and its inhabitants, the continued development of cutting-edge science and technology, the defense of the Federation itself, and the facilitation of its diplomacy. To meet these obligations, the service operates fleets of starships and a network of star bases spread throughout Federation territory. Starships operated by Starfleet Command have followed the same basic design principles since the organization's founding, Very true. prioritizing exploration, research, and defense. Mm -hmm. Even the smallest vessels often feature sophisticated Unless they have the name Farragut, I'm just saying. If you have the name Farragut on a ship, I don't know why you would go to it. ...indicated laboratories and medical centers, as well as advanced shielding and other countermeasures that prioritize crew survivability. Exploratory cruisers, vessels designed to undertake multi-year missions into uncharted space, resemble nomadic cities in their configuration and capabilities. In addition to a variety of mission-focused facilities, these ships include numerous amenities intended to make life aboard as comfortable as possible. Starfleet personnel routinely live and travel with their families, leading to significant civilian populations on most Starfleet vessels. Which is dumb. These vessels are constructed and maintained within enormous fleet yards either in orbit or on the surface of major Federation worlds. Mm -hmm. Other installations operated by Starfleet include a variety of training facilities, research stations, and miscellaneous outposts. Starbases are among the largest facilities ever constructed by the Federation, Utterly capable massive. of housing dozens of starships and hundreds of thousands of support staff. Like fleet yards, these are typically placed in orbit of strategic planetary bodies, though a series of deep space stations are located on the periphery or even far outside of Federation territory. The service's primary headquarters and highest operational authority is based in San Francisco on Earth. From here, the Chief of Starfleet Operations, Chief of Staff, and other high-level officers are responsible for directing the organization's efforts. They report directly to the office of the Federation President, who holds the position of Commander-in-Chief. The size of the Federation necessitates the existence I hated her, anyhow. ...of many subordinate sector commands. These oversee operations of the service across the various sectors of Federation space. Sector commanders are granted the authority to carry out the directives of Starfleet Command over large sections of the Federation. Mm -hmm. And in the case of newly established frontier sectors, 
often with little supervision or communication from Earth. But across the whole of Starfleet, there is no position endowed with greater responsibility than that of a Starfleet captain. Those placed in command of a Federation starship are expected to assume the role of a scientist, diplomat, engineer, negotiator, peacekeeper, and any combination thereof as a situation mm -hmm. might dictate. When operating beyond the limits... Best Captain Cisco, my opinion. Second Picard, third Janeway. Never had much of a fandom for Kirk here. The Federation territory, they must be prepared to act autonomously and make decisions with the potential to affect countless lives. They are often the first representatives of the Federation encountered by new life and new civilizations and required to demonstrate the highest values of Starfleet. Many who have served in this elite position have become some of the most celebrated individuals across the Federation's history, with names like Archer, Kirk, Picard, Sisko, and Janeway ascending to become almost legendary in reputation, both within the Federation and beyond. You see, the one I could not get that much into Enterprise, I couldn't take it seriously as a show, because Scott Bakula overacted like nobody's business. While the exploits of its famous captains are the most visible and admired aspect of Starfleet Command, the service maintains numerous other branches and agencies critical to its function. Starfleet Operations, Starfleet Medical, Starfleet Research and Development, and a multitude of other components provide the necessary auxiliary and support services that sustain Starfleet's ambitious purpose. Mm -hmm. Many of these subdivisions have also won acclaim across the galaxy, with the Starfleet Corps of Engineers yes. said to be able to turn rocks into replicators. That's a myth. Branches of Starfleet Command Maybe. have not been without controversy, however. Starfleet Security, the Federation's primary intelligence agency, has suffered numerous setbacks and embarrassments. The exposure of secret experimental tests into illegal cloaking technology... Dam yes, like... Yeah. Yeah. ...diplomatic relations with the Romulan Star Empire. While Let's be honest, the, the... In Star Trek, the Romulans damage their own reputation, and the Cardassians are no better. The spread of the rebellious Maquis, seemingly unchecked, nearly led to war with the Cardassian Union. Mm -hmm. Most troubling to Starfleet's reputation are the rumors of a secret division, either directly under Starfleet Security's command or a rogue branch that split from the Federation entirely. Unverified accounts claim it is known only to a select few individuals outside its own membership, subject to no oversight Section or accountability 31. whatsoever. The existence of a hidden cabal of operatives positioned at every level of the Federation government and Starfleet's hierarchy has never had any credible evidence, however, and has largely been discounted. Instead, Starfleet is likely the purest embodiment of the Federation's original purpose, that of mutual discovery and cooperation. Its crew and officers come from every one of the Federation's worlds, the largest example in the galaxy of a successful multi-species organization. On any given ship, there might be personnel from hundreds of different species, thousands of different worlds, and even those from outside the Federation itself. This is true. Starfleet has even accepted members from species that were considered its enemies at the time to mm -hmm. serve within it, including Klingons, Romulans, and even... F Not really. The la the... the... Mm. <sighs> that was a problem. That was, the, that was the whole thing behind the drumhead. Anyhow. Former Borg drones. This That's level true. of diversity extends throughout the organization, up to and including the highest echelon of Starfleet Command. The cognitive diversity within Starfleet is its greatest strength, and responsible for its technological and cultural sophistication. Starships with diverse crews have been proven to come up with more creative solutions to problems, are more likely to identify potential risks, and do so not only more consistently, but more quickly. Every crewman, regardless of species or world, is trained for their career at Starfleet Academy. Admission here is determined by a series of rigorous entrance exams and psychological tests. And recommendations. Graduates are then eligible for specialized advanced courses, including tactical training, medical school, command school, or the Starfleet Bridge Officer Examination. Numerous crew divisions exist across the whole of Starfleet, but most personnel are represented within the three uniform divisions. 
Command, Operations, and Sciences. Starfleet's organization, doctrine, and traditions were predominantly in. I will never stop being pissed off about Enterprise, the last episode. Just you, the whole. Uh, if, if you've never watched it, uh, you know what? Screw it. it, it the fact that it was all a hologram pisses me off to no end. Inherited from its direct predecessor of the same name, which operated under the authority of the former United Earth. During the establishment of the United Federation of Planets, the interstellar branches of its first members, the Andorian... That guy right there, that actor on uh, playing the Andorian Shrine, that guy has represented so many different characters, it's just fun to watch. ...an Imperial Guard, Vulcan High Command, and others were folded into Starfleet and eventually phased out entirely. Since then, Starfleet's history has been one of exploration and expansion, interrupted by a few key conflicts. Both the Klingon Empire and the Romulan Star Empire proved to be powerful and capable opponents, threatening the security or even existence of the Federation multiple times across their mutual history. Mm -hmm. An alliance with the Klingons and the isolation of the Romulans led to one of the longest lasting periods of peaceful discovery in Starfleet history. Yes. Contact with new belligerent races such as the Cardassians and Zenkethi led to a series of regional conflicts. But it was the arrival of the cybernetic... Which the Federation really should have blown out of the water, but they didn't. And I, you know, th because by that point, the long peace, because of the alliance with the Cleons, had turned the Federation mostly excessively pacifistic and not willing to engage with the toys that they had. I mean, the Cardassians thought that a Nova-class ship was... No, not a Nova. Nebula-class ship was a warship. And pr that was pre-Dominion War refit Nova-class which was hardly armed, and it wiped out two ships of the Cardassians like they were nothing. Borg that ultimately ended Starfleet's golden era. In the disastrous Battle of Wolf 359, the Federation suffered the darkest day in its history up to that point, when a single Borg cube destroyed 40 Starfleet vessels in a matter of minutes. 39. With the realization that such threats existed, Starfleet began a militarization campaign, tamed by the standards of Klingons or Romulans, Massively. but still unprecedented in Federation history. Starfleet's shift in priorities was ultimately necessary, not against the Borg, but rather the Dominion, an enormously powerful empire located on the far side of the galaxy. The Dominion became connected to Federation space through the Bajoran wormhole and immediately began courting mm -hmm. powers traditionally hostile to the Federation. The Federation picked a fight, literally. Um, there's no other way to say it. The Federation picked the fight with the Dominion. Most notably, the Cardassian Union and the Breen Confederacy. The Dominion War would prove to be the single bloodiest conflict in Starfleet history with the loss of thousands of vessels and millions of lives. Mm -hmm. Even San Francisco, the heart of Starfleet Command, would be openly attacked during the conflict, By the brain. something long considered impossible. With the eventual defeat of the... Not, not considered impossible, but really considered a absolutely insane, insanely suicidal move, even by the Klingons. The Minion and the Borg seemingly crippled, Starfleet has once again returned to its exploratory roots. For all its centuries of discovery, the galaxy is still largely unexplored, and Starfleet's mission to seek out new life and new civilizations can once more continue unabated. The introduction of technology and methods from Vulcan, Andoria, Teller Prime, and a hundred other member worlds from across the Federation has revolutionized Starfleet. But even now, the design lineage from the earliest human starships can still be recognized. Mm -hmm. It is a reminder of an increasingly distant era, when old adversaries and galactic newcomers set aside their differences in the pursuit of a greater purpose. Every manner of adversary has threatened to crush the dream of the Federation, but history has shown that rarely do high ideals survive the practicalities of the universe until they are carried aboard the ships of Starfleet Command. Nice summer. I like it. Very much like it. So, 
I watched Trek when I was a kid. I mean, I remember watching um, The Next Generation. I'd be sitting there just watching that every chance I could get. Um, and then, you know, it... You know, Star Trek was my introduction into science fiction, and for the large, for the longest period of time, even though I've, been, even though I consider it the most unlikely, considering how screwed up as a species we are, it's also like I consider 40k more, more, you know, what I expect our future to be like than Star Trek in any way, shape, or form. But um. I always thought the message was extremely important. This is what we could be. This is this is what we could. These are the ideals we should strive for. Um, and I applaud that. I really, really do. And one of these days, I hope that we wake up as a collective species here. And I hope we realize that we are what we're capable of and the things that we can do because it would be so nice if we would stop fighting over petty stupid crap and get around to actually you know taking hold of what we're capable of and we're capable of quite a lot but we get wrapped up in ridiculousness all right, enough pontificating for me. Like and subscribe if you guys haven't already. Um, if you'd like to request more Star Trek stuff, just jump on in the Discord down in the description below. All the Templin Institute's links are going to be in the description down below. So, uh, if you want to go check out the channel, which I highly recommend doing, they make great introductory and advanced videos for different topics. So, if you don't, if there's, if you just want to explore, um, like universes, factions in those universes, things like that, Templin Institute is always a good bet because they're very high, they're very well researched and they're very well rounded. No, you're not going to get into like excessively deep dive lore. You're not going to do that. But at the same time, that's not what the Templin Institute does. And I applaud them for their approach. Um, me personally, I'm always trying to find my feet and how I want to present things. And that's just me. In any case, my, my link's going to be in the description down below, including my page, uh, Patreon, PayPal, Discord, everything like that. So, come on in Discord and throw a rock at me. In any case, thank you guys for joining me. And, uh, I'm not going to do it because that's so cringe I'd break my own spine. But, yeah. You guys have a good day. And, um, yeah. The Dominion War sucked. Section 31 was a given. One of the things that I want to do moving forward is just think about, like, how we never wind up playing a Star Trek-esque Federation in Stellaris. Ever. We are always the Imperium. I'll catch you guys next time.